Committees. Senator Biden has served on the committee since 1976 and has been the chairman for four years. Ladies and gentlemen, you've had a long several days. You've had a number of very distinguished speakers and the seminars in which you have been involved have hopefully been of uh, significance for you in doing your job. Those of you who will not be graduating this year, who will be going back to take over the helms of the various law reviews in this nation. And I will say one thing serious before I move on to this. I must tell you, and I don't think I've said this publicly before, but I think it warrants being said before all of you. I truly am uh, embarrassed by the immature way in which I approach law school. It was such an incredible waste of a valuable opportunity. But I was one of the very lucky people in that being chairman of the Judiciary Committee, as the dean and I were discussing, it is not an exaggeration to say I have had an opportunity to go back to law school. And the finest legal minds in America, without the mildest bit of exaggeration, have been and continue to be and are available to me, literally on call. The generosity and the legal talent in this nation, when asked to be put to service in any way that would affect the interest of their country, is astounding. I have not had a single person, a single person, from Dean Griswold to professors of significant consequence, less known, like Walter Dellinger, although Walter, I guess, is pretty well known on TV these days, who has not been willing to do everything literally from coming to my house and giving me my own private seminars for literally hours at a time. The benefit of dealing with these judicial nominations, which are the thing that I dislike the most about my job. I was a public defender judge, and I was a plaintiff's lawyer judge, truly because I learned what you'll all learn about yourselves, by the way, those of you who practice. You'll find out how you are constitutionally constructed, what you're most comfortable in doing the thing that is most compatible with who you are, with your personality. I became a public defender and a plaintiff's lawyer because I am not comfortable judging others, judging other women and men. It is not a, it was not and is not a job that I aspire to, and it is not a position with which I feel any great sense of comfort in performing that mission. But in fulfilling my responsibility as the United States Senator and of late as Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I feel a greater responsibility. It sounds a little bit, uh, well, I'll let you determine how it sounds. There are certain things by which a woman or man will be measured in the performance of their duty, whatever their responsibilities and obligations are. In the person who chairs a hearing on who will be a Supreme Court Justice, one of the nine most important persons affecting the lives in ways more significant and long-lasting than any president or any Congress has or will, it is not something that one can with any degree of responsibility, not take very seriously. So I've had the advantage of literally preparing without exaggeration for hundreds of hours for these hearings. <coughs> Professor, well, there's too many, but I would get them in trouble, but we, as a consequence of that, I've had the opportunity to go back to law school, in effect in a way that was not unlike uh, um, having your own series of private tutors. And so it took me until age 40 
to have the maturity that all of you have at age 22 and 24 and 5 and 1 to understand and appreciate the majesty of the law. And so I compliment you all, for you are the people who hopefully are not only going to understand the law, but understand the majesty of the law. It is the only truly defining element of this country The only thing this diverse, most heterogeneous nation, the most heterogeneous democracy on the face of this earth has that holds it together is one uniform commitment to seek our own aspirations through and with the help of a body of law embodied in the Constitution that you obviously have understood it is important to understand to be practitioners of our trade. And the role of the Senate in advising and consenting to presidential nominations to the federal courts has been debated periodically and vigorously throughout the history of our nation. In that recurrent debate, the most frequent and most controversial question has been whether the Senate of the United States, in fulfilling its constitutional responsibility, has the right or even the obligation to examine the judicial philosophy of a nominee. And I'm going to take a few minutes to discuss with you what I believe that role is and should be in terms of reviewing the Constitution and our history. But before I do that, for those out there who are, unlike us, non-lawyers, it's pretty basic. They understand it very well. Here is a co-equal branch of the government the only non-elected branch, the only branch of the government once acquiring that seat, it is yours forever as it should be. And they understand, the public, what we will debate in more esoteric terms, that they affect our lives in ways that are immeasurable. And the mere fact that the president nominates someone does not shift the burden from that nominee and the president to the Senate. The burden remains on the nominee to prove that they are worthy of the job, not unlike a president must prove he is worthy of the job by standing for an election or a senator or a congressperson. It's really quite basic, folks. The notion that one co-equal branch of government affecting everything about our lives would be able to be acquired a position in that co-equal branch merely because a single man says, I like that person, without any examination of what their vision for America is, is a preposterous notion on its face. And the public understands that. The non-lawyers understand that well. And we lawyers spend a lot of time confusing it a little bit. Now let me engage in some of the confusion, add to the confusion. 
and speak in more specific terms. Should we consider not only the character and competence and experience, but also the judicial philosophy of a nominee? The hearings on the last three nominees, Bork, Kennedy, and Souter, have been characterized by many as historic in their reaffirmation of the Senate's right and duty to take the broadest possible view of a nominee's qualifications and have been characterized by others as a distortion and a manipulation and a politicization, politis, politicizing the process. <laughs> and as the committee chairman of the committee, when this change or reaffirmation, as I view it, took place, and having been blamed for and given credit for the change, I feel obliged to tell all of you why I think it should be as it is and why I believe it to be a reaffirmation rather than a change. I am content to leave, obviously, the ultimate judgment of the wisdom of the course of action I have set the Senate on to the historians of the future, some of whom I realize are among those to whom I am speaking. But I believe the historians of the past can shed some light on whether or not we were right and how the ultimate outcome may be viewed. As a student of the law of late and of history for a long time, I would argue that with regard to most Supreme Court nominations, the Senate has chosen to apply wisely and correctly, in my view, the broad standard. The standard which has included as a matter of course the constitutional and judicial philosophies of the nominees in question. To put that proposition to the test, let's begin where my conservative friends always like to begin, looking at the language of and the original intent of our framers. In characteristically, characteristically simple words, the Constitution provides that the President and the, and here I am quoting, shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint judges of the Supreme Court. To understand the full import of this provision, I think we have to examine the intent of the framers. And the examination is uh, a little complicated because the framers had trouble making up their own minds about judicial nominations. The delegates of the Constitutional Convention originally intended to give the Senate exclusive control over the judicial appointment process from Supreme Court on down, and to leave the President totally out of the process. Beginning in July of 1787, they rejected on four separate occasions attempts to include the President in the game at all. There were four specific votes to allow the president to enter into the process in any way, to give the president that responsibility. And they were soundly and roundly rejected. And they did not, in fact, adopt the advice and consent compromise until September, a very hot September, the closing days of the convention. And their intent was clear, in my view. The man who had just won a revolution against tyranny of royal powers had no intention of making the Senate simply a rubber stamp in the hands of a dominant president. The president was accorded the power of making judicial nominations, but those appointments could be concluded only with the co-equal consent of the Senate. The advice and consent compromise, as the framers clearly understood, was the best way to assure that the, that the judiciary remain independent of both the legislative and executive branches of our government. And as events proved uh, before long, the Senate would not at all be reluctant to exercise its responsibility to give and withhold the consent of presidential nominees. Even more to the point, the first Supreme Court nominee to be rejected by the Senate was rejected specifically and totally on ideological grounds. When Chief Justice John Jay resigned from the Supreme Court in 1795, President Washington nominated John Rutledge of South Carolina to take his seat. 
Now, it can hardly be argued that John Rutledge, one of the framers, was unqualified to hold the seat. He was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of his state, one of the framers. Hardly be argued that he didn't understand the document he had only recently helped frame. And there was no question about his judicial qualifications, as I said, for he was Chief Justice of the South Carolina Supreme Court. Nor can it be argued that senators who rejected him did not know the intent of the advise and consent clause, because three out of the 14 who voted against him were also counted among the framers. But they had no problem with rejecting Rutledge on exclusively ideological grounds, and that was because he opposed the 1795 Jay Treaty with Britain. That rejection firmly established a precedent that inquiry into judicial nominees' substantive views is a proper and essential part of the confirmation process. And it came as a surprise to many when I delivered a, the antecedent speech on this issue before the Bork nomination to the ABA in San Francisco. Every editorial writer in America was writing. There was only one thing we could look at, and that was whether or not this was a man of moral standing, a man who had a sound judicial temperament, and a man who had a academic and practitioner's understanding of the Constitution. Almost every major newspaper in America wrote an editorial to that effect. And went out to speak to the ABA and pointed out to the ABA in refreshing people's recollections that more Supreme Court nominees have been rejected than any other single group of nominees in the history of the United States of America. 28 in all, now 28 in all, have either been rejected or withdrawn this was not a new phenomenon, as was being asserted. And almost in every case, they're rejected because of ideology or philosophy. It played a central role. Between the Jackson and Lincoln, Lincoln presidencies, no fewer than 10 out of 18 Supreme Court nominees failed to win confirmation. And debates over the 20th century nominees have been on the whole much more civil than they were in the 19th century. For an art, but nonetheless, in our time, four nominees have been rejected. Fortas, Hainsworth, Carswell, and Robert Bork. In the case of Fortas, Hainsworth, and Carswell, although they were, there were other issues at stake, the debate, nevertheless, was centered on their constitutional views as well as their professional competency. And those hearings produced at least one footnote of more than passing interest today. Senator Fannin of Arizona quoted from a letter written by a young lawyer from Arizona, now the chief, William Rehnquist. In 1959, Mr. Rehnquist wrote, what now I think most people will agree is the proper standard by which the Senate should look at nominees. And he wrote, and I quote, that the Senate should return to its traditional practice, as he described it, of, quote, thoroughly informing itself on the judicial philosophy of the Supreme Court nominee before voting to confirm him. Such a broad consideration of the views and qualifications of judicial nominees was clearly, precisely, the means by which the framers intended to guarantee an independent judiciary. And although the Constitution sets the Senate's responsibilities in reviewing Supreme Court nominees uh, and grants us broad powers to do so. It offers us no specific guidance on how we should go about exercising that power. First, it's worth noting that there is no necessary link between considering a nominee's views on substantive issues and questioning the nominee on substantive issues. The issue with Bork that was played out again was whether or not we had the right or obligation to question him on his substantive views. 
At the outset, I might add, the legal community and the professorial community did not speak up very much on that at all. A week into the hearings, over 250 law professors had signed a letter saying, now I know his views, for God's sake do not confirm him. And so, the issue in Souter was different. The issue in Souter was not whether or not we had that right or obligation, but what were the proper bounds of questioning. Was it appropriate? And the key issue of the day is abortion. Was it appropriate to ask questions of Judge Souter on his views on abortion. Never did anyone doubt that the nominee could refuse to answer anything he or she wished to refuse to answer. But was it appropriate for knowledgeable, well-intended women and men to ask those questions? I asked my staff to go back with the help of some legal scholars and practitioners who are no part of my staff. And we went and looked at every single solitary nominee, every single solitary one, and cataloged and listed every single solitary question ever asked of any judicial nominee for the Supreme Court. And guess what we found out? We didn't have to go back very far. No one had any reluctance in 19, I forget the first year, quite frankly, that Thurgood Marshall was nominated. No one had any reluctance since the burning issue of the day was criminal procedure and the rights of criminal defendants. No one had any trouble specifically asking him how he would rule on the contentious cases of the day, including Miranda. He was specifically asked, how would you rule? And he answered. My conservative friends never even gave it a thought that that was inappropriate. The legal community at the time never suggested, clearly as a body never suggested, it was inappropriate. Not shortly thereafter, when the next nominee that came along, Justice Stewart, he was asked, how would he rule on Brown? The ink hardly dry on the decision. Notwithstanding it being a unanimous decision, the legal community had by that time determined how it became a unanimous decision. No one even blinked an eye. Yet, when Judge Souter came along, there was a you and cry before the hearings began about how inappropriate it would be. From a constitutional standpoint, a historical standpoint, there's nothing inappropriate about asking him. But here's where, hopefully, common sense enters the process and comedy is interjected into what Professor Corwin, in another context, discussing the issue of foreign policy, said the Constitution issues little more than an invitation to the branches of government to struggle over who will be predominant. There is nothing precise about how it functions, but there is and has been, thank God, a lubricant of common sense and comedy that has been interjected at the appropriate times. 
And so, some of us concluded that it would be practically inappropriate, not constitutionally, to insist that Judge Souter answer how he would, what his views were on reproductive rights. I spent some time, as some of you will recall, going back to my instincts as a trial lawyer, Judge, pointing out how inconsistent he was. Some of you will recall I questioned him at length on his views of the Equal Protection Clause as it applied to women, and which standard did he apply? Whether he applied the strict standard, the intermediate test, or the rational basis test. And I believe it's not an exaggeration to say for several hours we discussed that issue. And he was very forthcoming. But when I asked him not how he would rule on Roe, but what standard would he apply? He refused to answer. It is his right to refuse to answer. It is the right of any nominee to refuse to answer any question. As a matter of fact, what most people don't recall is the Senate Judiciary Committee has not been in this business all that long. A number of nominees have been rejected without ever having been asked a single solitary question. There's nothing in the Constitution that says the Senate Judiciary Committee will be the first step in the process. That is an institutional decision totally within the, prerog the prerogative of the Senate to make as to how they wish to handle the process. But there's nothing in the Constitution about the Senate Judiciary Committee. And the only point I wish to make here is that Judge Souter, I think from his perspective and possibly from the perspective of the nation, made the right decision in not answering. For it was clear no matter which way he answered the question, very nearly 50% of the United States Senate would vote against him. Because it's the single most divisive issue in recent American history. Arguably one of the most divisive interest issues in the history of the Republic. And so he concluded that he would keep his own counsel. But he gave us some significant insights into his views on privacy and how he would measure other great questions of the day. And so that leads me to the third and last point I wish to make to you. The tempo with which the examination of a Supreme Court justice is undertaken, and this is historically the case, depends on three factors. Assuming they, on their face, possess the competence to be in the court. They have not committed any crimes of moral turpitude. They are bright and informed, and they have a sound judicial temperament. All of which acknowledge, I acknowledge are subjective, but all of which are minimally required for the job. When one of the following three factors is introduced, the ball game changes from just looking at those three things to a detailed examination of one's philosophy. One is when the president concludes, as Ronald Reagan did, and said it straightforwardly, that he was going to put forward a social agenda that he was unable to pass through the Senate and the House, a Republican Senate as well as a Democratic Senate, his entire social agenda was rejected. Everything else he wanted in his eight years was accepted. I won't go into that. 
<laughs> but his entire social agenda was rejected. He made it very clear what he could not accomplish through the legislative branch, he, and it was his right to, there's nothing the Constitution says he could not do it, he was going to attempt to accomplish through the third branch of the government. If you notice, when he spoke to any of his nominees, he first spoke to police organizations. They're the people to whom he announced it and said, we want this man because he will be tough on crime and he will do A, B, C, and D. He made it a position in his campaign that he would not support, appoint anybody to the court that did not support a pro-life position. It is, right, it is his right to do so. But whenever a president of the United States lays down the gauntlet and says, I am exercising my right to remake the court in my image, to remake the court so that it shares a vision for the future of America similar to mine. The Senate has always said, oh, wait a minute. Some of you will recall, you students may not because you were so, and I mean it sincerely, understandably preoccupied with the nature of your responsibility at the moment, your first year of law school, some of you were. But the professors in here will remember. The president said, as did Attorney General Meese, we will make this a referendum on the Warren Court. Remember that? And remember the foolish young senator who said, I agree. Because I never doubted for a minute that the American public supports and does not have any intention of moving back from the expansion of rights brought about through the Warren Court. There's not a woman in here who wants to see it turn back, not just on choice. Forget choice. Let's assume there will, there will be women in here that wish to do that, men in here that wish to do that. But I don't know any significant portion of the public that wishes to turn back the clock in terms of the basic civil rights and civil liberties that have been guaranteed under the Warren Court. At any rate, I was prepared to test that thesis. The point I'm making here is not whether or not I was right or wrong, but that what I did was no different than what had been done historically. When the president says, we're going to do it my way, and I ran on a platform and believe very strongly the direction he wishes to take the country is inimical to, in, inimical to its interest, I have an obligation to make my case the other way. I don't have an obligation or a responsibility or a right to be able to choose who is on the court. But I do, and every single senator does, have an obligation if he believes the person nominated to the court holds views inimical to the interest of the country to vote against them. And so the president laid down the gauntlet, and the Senate responded. And not only did Judge Bork lose, he lost by the largest plurality of any judge, any nominee ever lost. It wasn't close. The second time when the Senate gets deeply involved in the philosophy, and totally understandable when you think about it, is when the balance of the court is at stake. When the appointment of an additional member to the, a new member to the court will fundamentally alter the direction the court has been going. There's nothing like looking over the precipice to focus one's attention. That's when the president focuses. That's when the Congress focuses. The Senate focuses. And the third time is when a nominee has written, spoken, legislated, taught doctrines and theses that were so out of step with where the majority of the country was that they invite not only scrutiny, but rejection. One of the things that sort of got everybody's attention 
was when Justice Bork wrote and stood by it, God bless him, because he was intellectually honest, there are two dozen landmark decisions that should be overturned. And then when asked for his view on stare decisis, he defined it in a way that made it clear, and I think he's probably correct, I won't debate that issue tonight, that there are no constraints upon a sitting justice in the court. And that got people's attention. When the incorporation doctrine, which some of you could argue from a constitutional perspective, should not exist, should be turned back. When we should decide that Griswold versus Connecticut was wrongly decided, and should be overturned given the opportunity. A Warren Court decision that I think the vast majority of Americans are not likely to want to change. They may be disagreeing on the privacy question relating to abortion, but on whether or not contraceptives can be used by consenting adults is not something I think is likely to be open to referenda in this country. And that's the third time, the third circumstance you'll find historically where the United States Senate says, hey, wait a minute, we have a keen interest. And that's also the time a president says and should say, I've got a keen interest. Because the decision will affect what happens to this country long after Senator Biden is gone, long after President Bush is gone, long after President Reagan's administrations are forgotten. If they live, if Justice Souter, God willing, lives, as long as the average age of the court now, he'll be making landmark decisions in the year 2020. I'll be dead and gone in all probability. And so it's important. Because there's a time lag. Those on the court continue in exercise of their responsibility to affect the lives of Americans well beyond the so-called policymakers' ability to affect it. And so I would respectfully suggest to you that the issue of whether or not someone's judicial philosophy is appropriately appropriate to be examined and the extent to which someone can be questioned should be is clearly within the realm of the rights of any senator but must be seasoned with an understanding of the need for a lubricant to keep the three branches functioning for a constant confrontation in the appointment process is not a healthy thing for the nation. It is not a good thing for the court, and arguably in its extreme, at least theoretically, could have impact upon the views of nominees and commitments before they arrive on the bench. But I suspect and believe, as long as one of the three circumstances I named, the balance of the court being at stake, the understood views of a nominee being significantly out of step with the social mores of the nation, or the president concluding that he will use the court as a vehicle to realize his political agenda, if any three of those exist, we will only be able to count on and hope for the measured inquiry with fairness of a Senate, which cannot be guaranteed. But I believe thus far has been accomplished. Even more to my present point, I believe the wide-ranging dialogue between the committee and in the case of Judge Souter, 
reaffirm the right and the duty of the Senate to impose a broad inquiry upon the Supreme Court nominee. As I said, I believe the Senate Judiciary Committee's hearings on Bork, Kennedy, and the Souter nominations, in fact, reaffirm the central role of the Senate and Supreme Court nominations. They reaffirmed our right and our duty to ask searching questions about the nominee's philosophy, and then to grant or withhold our consent according to those questions and how they are answered. For the Supreme Court holds far-reaching power over the constitutional rights and daily lives of every American. Throughout our history, the impact of the court on what we can do, what we can say, how we can live, has exceeded that of any president or of any Congress. The fact of the matter is that we hold many of the freedoms we enjoy today because of the wisdom and the courage and the foresight of the 105 justices who have sat on the Supreme Court. But there have been moments in our history when the court has come to a crossroads, moments when the court's future has confronted its past, moments when the long-term direction of the court is at stake. And today, I believe our nation, our Constitution, as interpreted by the court, is at such a crossroads. Today, great issues are at stake at the court, great precisely because they affect the most intimate decisions of our lives. And the questions that surround those issues have brought us to a fateful moment in our history. At such moments, the American people and the Senate on their behalf have not only the right to know, but the duty to discover what nominees to the Supreme Court think about such great constitutional questions. I think we have an obligation to do no less. Thank you very much. I know it is late, um, and uh, I fully appreciate the fact you've been here a long time, and there's a cocktail party to follow. <laughs> uh, and I learned early on in my political career, never stand between a person and a cocktail party, <laughs> um, but, or a ladies' room or a men's room. Uh, but uh, um, I was asked whether or not I would entertain some questions, uh, and I'd be delighted to do that, and I would fully understand, and I mean this sincerely, if in the process uh, some of you had to leave temporarily or permanently, uh, and, uh, and I mean that sincerely, uh, but I'd be happy to take any questions, uh, attempt to answer any questions, not only in this subject, but any subject you'd like to raise. Professor? I certainly want to express my personal opinion for an extremely stimulating talk. I wondered if uh, you read the Constitution with regard to advice and consent as invoking a role for the public to exercise advice and consent with regard to the inquiry that you described and the uh, registering of advice and consent with regard to the nominee. I think that, that is a really good question because it is the fundamental question. The Founding Fathers, in my view, Professor, and you understand that, as that old saying goes, you've forgotten more about the Constitution than I'm going to learn, and you understand this well. The Founding Fathers could find no other vehicle in a representative democracy other than one of the existing branches of government through which their voice could be heard. The only way, and consequently, I would argue by implication, expected that we would reflect not only our own views, but would be reflective of the views of our constituencies. And so I don't think it's at all inappropriate for the public. It is not dispositive, but it is not all in, at, at all inappropriate. It was intended, in my view, that the United States Senate, given this responsibility, would by least implication reflect the views of the body politic. The new phenomenon has been that in the Bork nomination, I would get on the train going back to my home state 
of Delaware, which I commute every day, and I get on the train, and people, I am not exaggerating, would be arguing, the conductors would be discussing and arguing whether or not strict scrutiny was an appropriate standard. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? I am not kidding. People understood it. It was brought home to them. For example, in the, in the uh, Michael Kay decision, one of the things people say, Michael K. footnote six, what does all that mean? People understand what it means. They understood after the Souter hearing was over that Michael K. meant if you agreed with Justice, Justice Scalia's methodology for determining whether or not an unenumerated right existed, you would end up with results that were significantly different than many Americans were prepared to live with. For example, Loving versus Virginia, using the methodology suggested by Justice Scalia, which says that you must go back and look at the historical precedent in determining whether or not a right was intended to be protected, acknowledged, constitutionally guaranteed. You must look at the specific application of the right being sought. So you look at anti-miscegenation laws. The historical tradition of the United States is we have not intended for black folks and white folks to marry. A significant portion of states said, hey, you cannot marry. Applying the methodology suggested in footnote six as pointed out by Justice Brennan and others, I might add, including Kennedy, would have required a different conclusion in Loving versus Virginia, the anti-miscegenation case. Because we have no tradition of protecting the specific right of blacks to marry whites. But the way in which the court of the last three decades has applied, what methodology they have applied, is much broader. You look at the broad question. Do we have in our English jurisprudential background a history of intending to protect the right of marriage, of who one can choose as their spouse? And there is no question about that. Ergo, the majority of the court has concluded that although it is not an enumerated right in the Constitution, there's a methodology for concluding that such a right existed and was intended to exist. People understand that, Professor. Don't have to be a legal scholar to know that. And I wasn't kidding when I said, a significant number of Americans know what this is all about. The world has changed. People don't want anybody telling them what they can do in their bedroom or not in their bedroom. They don't want anybody telling them what they can do in or out of their bedroom with regard to the choice of partners, question of procreation. We're beyond that. And we don't even have to look to the penumbra <laughs> to conclude it. So as esoteric as footnote six is in the Michael K case. And to give you an example, you know what that case was about? It was about a person, a man, who fathered a child with a woman who was married to someone else. And a majority of the court, concurring with Scalia's point of view, said, hey, we have never protected the rights, historically, of adulterous, or of, of, the, of the fathers of illegitimate children. Therefore, that father has no right of visitation, notwithstanding the fact that the genealogical makeup of that child is of that father. People understand those things, and they don't have to be lawyers. So how a judge looks at the application, the determination of what methodology is applied, is going to fundamentally affect the future of this country. As they say, folks, you ain't seen nothing yet. We're talking about gene splicing. 
We're talking about cloning. We're talking about things we don't even know how to talk about. But the same principle will be at issue. The individual versus the government. The rights of the minority versus the majority. That will not change. But if you conclude, as you have every right to, and I totally disagree with you, if you conclude that we have progressed as far as we should progress, that there ain't no more unenumerated rights to enumerate ever, it's done, the book's closed, or as Bork concluded, that you should open the book and tear out some of the pages. <laughs> then you have a different view than me. And you have a right to that view. And you can pursue that view. But not with my vote. <laughs> I can really answer yes, no, if you have any of those kind of questions. <laughs> as you can see, I don't feel strongly about this subject at all. I, Yes, sir. I can barely see. There you go. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm basically in agreement with your um, views on the inquiry um, on the Jur Judiciary Committee. My one concern is, though, is that perhaps politicizing the nomination process in that way, that it'll tend to attract nominees who are virtually unknown, well, who well, haven't well, published, who haven't done anything. You're absolutely right. That is the concern. If you notice as I ended, I said, unless we, in a very judicious manner, exercise that right and responsibility, it could be unhealthy. It could produce another aberration in the development of the relationship among the three branches of government. And that's why I felt so strongly Although some of you will note, I never asked him directly that I felt, to be very blunt about it, I felt my obligation and what little tiny contribution from my perspective I could make to the history of the development of this process to the extent that I made any at all. And that is, that is, high, so that is high sounding above what it warrants. But that's why I devoted so much time to the scope of inquiry this time. Because that's what affects the question you asked. You say, how the hell does that work, Biden? Real simple. We had a man who never published. Therefore, it was essential for me to establish that a man who never published must speak. And if he does not, he does not pass. That was the second principle. For if we had not established, at least for the time being, under this Congress, in the near term, the remainder of this century, that the scope of inquiry will be as broad as I suggested it should be, then what you said would be exactly what would happen. Presidents would sit down with their advisors so they had plausible deniability. And the advisors would sit down with the nominee, with friends of the nominee, so they had plausible deniability. And they'd go say, how does Charlie feel about, because clearly it wouldn't be a woman in this outfit, how does Charlie feel about the following 12 issues? And then Charlie comes back and tells his buddy, and his buddy tells his buddy, and the presidential advisor goes to the president, I'm confident this is a good man. He's never said anything. Well, how do we know he's a good man? Don't worry, Mr. President. I have it on good authority. He's where we want him to be. He's honest. He's bright. He's decent, which all these nominees were, including, including Judge Bork. But that's all I have to know. They'll never get anything else out of him, Mr. President. But you can feel sure everything's going to be all right from your perspective. And had I not been able, had we not been able to establish the principle not just along Democratic lines. You recall the Republicans agreed fully with my position on the committee, on the scope of the inquiry, with two notable exceptions. Had that not been established, then exactly what you suggested would happen. And look, 
Any instrument of power in the hands of anyone abused is a bad thing. And any instrument of power has the overwhelming, overwhelming temptation to be abused. And so it really depends upon how you exercise that power, how you exercise it. And it will be abused. I'll, I assure you it will occur. There will be excesses both ways. But on balance, it's worked out pretty well over the history of the Republic. Yes, sir. During the full Senate censure of uh, Senator Durnberger, a number of your colleagues stood up and addressed the Senate with respect to the process by which you investigate your own. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the, the process. No. No, I'm only teasing. I, it's just, that's a good one to give a no answer to. Um, let me marshal my thoughts so I can make the answer short. One, none of us got elected in our minds to go and be judges. None of us wanted any part of that. So it is a responsibility that is avoided like the plague, having nothing to do with the clubbiness of the institution. The men who sat on the Ethics Committee consumed the better part of two years of their life, literally thousands of hours of their time. And that's not an exaggeration. And none of them wanted to do that. They came to the Senate because they believed strongly in arms control or against it, or they wanted to do this or that. None of it having to do with that, those issues. Second point, everyone understands there's no other mechanism without yielding the independence of a single branch of government to an abuse by another branch of government. It cannot be done. Similar problem that judges have with regard to judicial disciplinary actions, self-imposed. Thirdly, the process has never been as fully exhausted, literally and figuratively, as it has with Senator Durenberger and the so-called Keating Five. And the Senate has learned a lot. We have learned, number one, that it is not a very good system. It's not very good for the defendant, in effect, and it's not very good for the public. The irony is the public knows more detail about how campaigns are run, financed, there is more openness than ever before, and there is less confidence than ever before, which I argue should tell us something about why we should have public financing, but that's another question. We've also found out that all you have to do in today's age is raise the question. I need not tell the prosecutor that. Prosecutors are the most dangerous people in the world. I mean that literally. Literally. Because whether they're right or wrong, anyone who has public standing in a community can and is likely to be ruined just by an inquiry. Period. Forget innocent until proven guilty. And we have not yet, in my view, adequately determined how an administrative procedure which does not, as a matter of law, entitle a, a target of investigation of his, by his colleagues, of a colleague, to the same rights that one is entitled to in a criminal proceeding. But yet, there is an unintentional abuse of the process, in my view. Think about it. You are put in a position where a number of accusations are made about you. And for 18 months, you can't get to say a word. Nothing's been done. There's this behind doors investigation going on. 
for months. This is no exaggeration. You know, nobody talked to anyone on the ethics committee. We all eat together. We see each other. There's only 100 people. We're in the same building, the same committees. Never once did I ever hear the broad subject even raised with any member of the committee. Nor was the committee willing to even acknowledge it was, it was going on because everyone was afraid that if they asked anything or said anything, it would have the appearance because of the following thing, and I'll conclude. The issue here is only one thing, not violation of the law, but a self-imposed Senate standard, which should exist, of the appearance of impropriety. The appearance of impropriety. Nothing more, period. Let me tell you something, old boy. That is one hell of a subjective test to apply. And to apply it before 240 million people. And we haven't figured it out yet. And consequently, there are all the jokes that are going around that gets a laugh, and I even laugh at them when I hear them. You know, if we're going to get Saddam Hussein before the court, just make sure it's not a Senate court, and so on. So I'm dissatisfied with the process. I'm very dissatisfied with the way it functions. But ultimately, the people are going to make the determining judgment of that. If they're as dissatisfied as some appear to be, those senators who sat in the committee and senators like me who voted or didn't vote, most, we didn't even get to vote on most of them, by the way, are going to be held accountable. And those who were exonerated and or chastised in any way, they're going to be held accountable. If, in fact, the public thinks the appearance has risen to the level, are you trying to tell me something? Yeah, you are. <laughs> I can read sideways. T-I-M-E. But you're not very good. You would never make it in the Navy. You know, in those rooms, in the submarine rooms, you see one guy behind a glass thing with the whole map of the world on there, and he or she is writing backwards on the map so that the commanding general can see it. He would not have, we would not have ended up in Corregidor. We would have ended up in Taipan if, we had watched, if he had been doing it. Anyway, one last question. Yes, sir. Senator Biden, in your earlier discussion, you perhaps alluded to the notion that <coughs> limitations could be placed upon this scope of inquiry. Yes. Which, if any, would you suggest can be imposed upon the, uh, the Senate's inquiry into Supreme Court nominees? Again, there is no constitutional limitation on the scope of inquiry because the nominee has the constitutional right of not answering anything. Nominee could come before the Senate, say, I'm not going to say a word. Or could say, I won't come before the Senate, period. He's not constitutionally required to do that. But the Senate is constitutionally, constitutionally required to vote. And what will be, I'm serious, now this I, it sounds so, so, so elementary, but it's, but it's it's, 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 it's how, in my view, it has to be viewed. It's really not that complicated. The scope of inquiry will be regulated by the public at large. If the public believed that I conducted the hearing unfairly, when I stood for election last time, this last November, Instead of an overwhelmingly large number of people who were polled in my state and around the country thinking that Biden was a fair chairman, if they concluded that I was not a fair chairperson, I would be gone. Or I would not have won by the largest margin anyone ever has in the history of my state. It would have been different, literally. That's the ultimate governor on the license that senators will exercise. And hopefully, it will not have to be licensed after the fact, if you will. That we will understand, and the Senate historically over the 200 or some years has, that that license can be abused. But mark my words. 
when it's abused, when it's abused, the abuser ends up being abused by his constituency, as he should. That's how it works. People don't like people who judge other people. They don't like to watch the judging process. We Americans like the underdog. That's why if you notice, unlike the, and I will end with this, the Iran-Contra hearing, remember you saw those tiers and tiers of podium? And the dais after dais raised up? And Ollie North sitting down there in his uniform? And all these senators and congresspersons arrayed in front of him with their lawyers glaring down at him? Well, I tell you what, I take Ollie North. I want to be Ollie North's counsel on that one. All I want is that picture. I made the Senate tear down that entire apparatus because they wanted me to use that for the hearing. Do you notice, you have never seen me conduct a hearing where the nominee isn't sitting at the exact same level that I am and doesn't have a chair just as high and big as mine. Because the public is very sensitive to what they believe to be transgressions upon the rights of individuals they are watching. And television is such a, personable, a personal medium. And so if they think you've abused your license, then you'll be in trouble. And that's the ultimate governor. That and hopefully a dose of sound judgment which I'm going to attempt to exercise now by saying good night. Thank you very much. Senator Biden, on behalf of the Detroit College of Law and the National Conference of Law Reviews, we would just like to thank you for being with us and providing with you, us with your thoughts. Thank you very much. As usual, we have just a couple of uh, housekeeping announce to, uh, announcements to make to all of the delegates. Uh, the Darby Cocktail Party, as the, the Senator alluded to, uh, will be taking place as soon as you get back in the Cadillac room. Uh, the buses will be leaving immediately, um, and there is a 9 o'clock mandatory executive board meeting uh, tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Next, we turn to an interview with Constance Newman, the director of the Federal Office of Personnel Management. Since President Bush announced the nomination of Judge Thomas to be an associate justice on the Supreme Court, Ms. Newman has been working with the White House on the confirmation process. In this interview, we look at the administration's strategy throughout the confirmation process, how the White House works with congressional members and the media and interest groups. Connie Newman, Director of the Office of Personnel Management. Since the President announced the nomination of Judge Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court,